Well, I think the uh, believers that we're going to read about tonight want to go big too, right? Chapter 4 of First Peter. Go big. Go big for the Lord. Hey, let's pray before we start tonight, guys. All right? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord. You brought us here to fellowship, to share with one another, Lord, to uh, lift you up on high. For, Lord, you are good. And you love us so much, Father. As we uh, discuss our lesson tonight, as we read your word, Lord, let us worship you, Father. We pray that our worship would be through us fellowshipping with one another and uh, with studying your word and gleaning from it, Lord, and applying it to our lives. Father, thank you for this time. Uh, such a privilege to be together, Lord, when so many can't get together. So, Father, we are thankful and uh, give you all the glory tonight. In your name we pray, amen. All right, chapter four, First Peter. Well, we're really moving through this now, aren't we? What a great chapter, so much in it. You know, 11 verses we're gonna look at tonight. You could probably take three verses or two verses and do a complete study just on one or two verses from these 11 verses that we have in our text tonight. And, um, we're going to be focusing tonight on suffering, prayer, and serving. And they all tie together. Uh, but first of all, before we uh, get into chapter 4, let's uh, just read a couple verses from chapter 3, where we ended up and uh, last week, and it'll kind of tie into what we're looking at in uh, chapter 4 tonight. So we're looking at three uh, verse 3, 16, and, we'll, and 17 and 18, okay? So crack your Bibles open, let's, let's look at it. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So he is saying here, Peter's writing, have a good conscience that when those around you revile you, boy, they could be put to shame. You know, have a good conscience, a clear conscience. You know, be that light to the dark world, and they may be ashamed by your, your good conscience and your love for them. And also, it is always better to do the will of the Lord <laughs> than the will of man, isn't it? And to suffer for that, to suffer for doing his good will than doing the will of man, which can never really be totally good, right? It's only temporary. And to know that Christ suffered for the Jew, those Jewish believers then, and he, he has suffered for us too, as we go through the trials here on earth. And we are also made alive by the Spirit. Remember, Peter said, we are living stones, aren't we? Precious to God, first chapter, verse four and five. So we are living stones and precious to God. But as we read this tonight, verses one through 11 of chapter four, have in mind that Peter really has compassion for not only the believers, but he has compassion for the unbelievers here, as, we'll, as we will read. We have to remember also that suffering is a normal part of the Christian life, isn't it? You can look at your past and your Christian walk and see the suffering that you have gone through or maybe family members have gone through and know that, hey, that's what we go through. That's, that's our walk. But we're victorious in Christ Jesus. Um, if anyone knew suffering, it was Peter also. 
I mean, he witnessed the suffering of Christ. He was there. And he also, what, denied Christ, right? Suffered at that point, but yet he stayed submissive to the Lord, even during that time, staying submissive to the Lord. And these believers that we're going to read about suffered also. And Peter knew that, and he knows what they're going through. So we can have that same compassion with others, knowing that, hey, they're going through the same thing. My suffering is no different probably than their suffering. And unbelievers are going through some types of suffering, and they don't know where to turn. And so we need to be those lights. And we'll read that a little later as we get into the ministry that suffering brings uh, there. So verses 1 through 3, let's look at those first. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that no longer should live the rest of time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. So here, Peter starts off by saying that Christ, since he suffered for us, arm yourselves. Wow, arm yourselves. It's kind of a military term, isn't it? Military language here going on. And that's the way he starts this section. Um, it's like to equip yourselves, you know, arm yourselves. Arming yourselves in, in the Greek is like to equip, to like picking up your weapons, you know, get ready, you know, because, hey, there's a battle going on and there's going to be a battle going on. So we also need, Peter speaking to us here today, right now in this century, in our culture, to say, arm yourselves. And boy, what a time to do that right now. <laughs> you know, we're right in the midst of uh, quite a battle going on right now, and it's a spiritual battle, right? But I like this when he says that, arm yourselves, knowing that Christ suffered for you. Be prepared, because we are going into a spiritual battle. Our weapons are not carnal, are they? But they are what? Spiritual, yeah. Bringing down strongholds, Right? So we need to arm ourselves, what? With the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. That same mind. You know, Jesus came, suffered, and died for sin, for the sin of mankind. He came to give life. And what? That more abundantly. So he's saying here, with the mind of Christ, think clearly. Think clearly. Paul writes... In, in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, 16, he says, but the natural man, <laughs> the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Isn't that true? No matter how much you can talk to someone about the Lord, they're not quite getting it. They're not quite receiving it. And they don't see it, especially these believers that stood for the Lord. Those out there couldn't understand. They couldn't see that, that uh, what they, were, what they believed in and what they truly stood for. Because it goes on to say here, Paul writes, for they are foolishness to them, right? For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? And then Paul writes, but we have the mind of Christ. You know, when you guys, when we all gave our lives to the Lord, when we uh, surrendered ourselves to him on that day, you can remember it, well, for me, it was quite a long time ago, 1973. But that's the day that I was a new creation in Jesus Christ. That's the day when you became a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, with his mindset, putting on the mind of Christ at that time. You know, the Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ. You know, we represent him. We're ambassadors for him. So as we have that mind of Christ, knowing that he suffered for us, we also probably will have that suffering going on in our lives too. It's guaranteed, I guess, for us, isn't it? 
You know, Paul wrote, set your mind on things above, not on the things of earth. It's easy to get kind of pulled into the ways of the, of the world, you know, the world's ways, and by other, uh, by non-Christians or situations or the culture or someone's opinions. It's always working on us throughout the day. But, but uh, Paul wrote, set your mind on things above, Colossians 3, 2. So we need to have clear thinking, you know, kind of also to have a kind of a suffering attitude to things of this world. I thought of uh, the, the, the brother Joseph. You know, Joseph, uh, Jacob's son was, you know, his mindset was, was pretty clear. When uh, Potiphar's wife uh, brought sexual advances towards him, as you can read, you know, Joseph already set in his own mind, I, I'm not doing this. That's, that's clear thinking. You know, he said, how can I sin against my master? How could I sin against my God? So he suffered for doing right. He suffered for doing good. And when we choose to do right, we will, we will suffer too in some way. I also think of Daniel. Uh, what a great man of God. You know, set out to, to just praise the Lord, to love him, to do his will. And he de determined, the Bible says, not to defile himself, defile himself with the king's food. He didn't want to partake of those great looking things that he could have and eat. He wanted to stay trim and slim, man. He wanted to stay ready to serve the Lord, ready to, to go out into battle. So he suffered for doing right also. You know, a weak attitude that we may have can lead to defeat which is so true. If we have a weak attitude uh, towards the things of God, we, we can suffer defeat. But someone once said, outlook determines outcome. I like that. When we have an outlook that is totally sold for Jesus Christ, totally looking to him, the author and finish of our faith, we're gonna get there. We're gonna spend time in worship with him and not be swayed by the things of this world. So outlook, looking outward, determines our outcome. <laughs> and that's been so true in my life too. I can look back at the mistakes I've made, the setbacks, and Mike did not do the right thing at that time in my decisions. But there's also been victories. And over the years, I have learned well from the Lord, you know, and he's corrected me and he's changed me. And that's part of sanctification, isn't it? So one more example, and I like this, you know, of, of arming yourself with the same mind. Remember Gideon and his army? His, you can read that in Judges 7. Uh, Gideon uh, was to choose a certain number of men to go against the Midianites, right? Started out for like 30,000 men. And he said, hey, those who are fearful and can't go forward, step aside. And 22,000 of them just kind of, okay, see you later. And then he said, I want 10,000 to go down by the river. I want you to go down by the water and drink from the water. And many of them just put their heads down into the water and drank and slurped it up. But yet, there were, and they were let go. But a certain number of them took their palm and dipped it in the water and drank from their hand, looking up, looking up around them. And he chose those men, only 300 men, to go into battle against an army so big they were totally outnumbered. But there was a man who had a good outlook, a good, a good outlook, a good, good mind, you know, clearly thinking about what the Lord wanted him to do. So we need to have the same mind. As Christ suffered, we must be ready to suffer also just as these believers uh, suffered. But we can say, Lord, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to suffer. But those of us who want to serve the Lord and love him are going to suffer. But suffering can bring joy. It can bring real growth. But it can also bring some bitterness if you don't look at it the right way. You know, people become bitter because of their suffering. 
And it, it may be easy to do. We have to be careful that we don't become bitter uh, during, during that time. So let's look at some benefits of suffering tonight as we read these verses. Um, first of all, suffering can bring prayer and fasting. When we're suffering, and as a result maybe of our sin or the sin of, from others, what do we do? We spend a lot of time in prayer. I know when I'm suffering or I have a family member going through a time or a brother or sister in the Lord that, that are suffering, maybe physically, or maybe they're being uh, ridiculed by someone else in their family or being ignored or being put down, we spend that time in prayer. Man, we're on our knees, we're praying for them, because we love them so much, you know? And so we're more focused on Christ than in those times. Suffering can cause that. So when we're doing that, we're not then what? Giving our time to the lust of the flesh in any way, or looking somewhere else, or being drawn away off, off that straight path. So prayer, it can bring prayer and fasting. Also, because the benefits of suffering, secondly, we see the, effect, the effects of sin. Sin brings, can bring suffering. When we go through a time where we maybe can have been entertaining a sin or entertaining that kind of thing, and then we see someone else partake in it and they suffer because of it, Boy, that could really hit home, especially when it's within your own family and uh, a family member, and it's happened to them. You know, we can then see the effects of it. And boy, sin stinks, doesn't it? It really smells. It's darkness. It's death. And so going through suffering, we can see the effects of, of the sin, and we hate it. We hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves. Thirdly, suffering can bring real joy, real joy in our lives. You kind of wonder, well, how can that happen, you know? But it really can. It can give us victory. You know, we can re resist the devil, and we can resist sin, and when we momentarily, you know, as, as the devil you know, tempts us to be pulled into uh, a sin or a thought or uh, to go this way or that way, when we resist that, for the moment, we're kind of putting ourselves aside, aren't we? We're dying to ourselves, saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this against my Lord, against my God, or against someone else. And we, we stick it out. We stay with the Lord. We stay in his word. We pray. And then we get through that time. We go, oh, thank you, Lord. What a joy it is. You know, it just helped me to grow a little bit more, Lord. And so that's real joy. But for the moment, it's kind of like suffering because you're not partaking in that quick moment of maybe pleasure or a passion of some sort, which could be just about anything today. And so you hold off and you wait on the Lord and he takes you through it. And it, that's real joy, man. You can just rejoice and just celebrate in the Lord and have victory. So those trivial things, man, we could put aside and go, oh, thank you, Lord. Let's move on. Let's move forward. Let's encourage someone else who's going through this. James writes in the first chapter, verses 2 through 4, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials or sin, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. <laughs> but we, we know that verse. You guys know that verse. And it's a time we don't like to go through it, but what does James continue to write? He says, but let patience have its, what? Perfect work. And when we wait on the Lord, we see his perfect work in it. And I don't go rushing off to try to solve something or rushing to get out of something or rushing to, towards uh, that sin, but we wait on the Lord. James also writes in verse 4 and 7, he says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then he says, don't be double-minded. Don't be double-minded. This is not a study on James, but I felt it really tied in 
not for us to be double-minded, but single-minded, because we're to put the mind of Christ on. That's where we're to go, the mind of Christ. Don't be double-minded, because we're entertaining the world and trying to walk in the Lord. Boy, it's just, it's a miserable time. Verses 4 and 5. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Wow. They think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same, well, unbridled or excess of dissipation. <laughs> Why do you think they, they think it's strange? Right? Why do you think they think it's strange? Well, because the Bible says we're strangers. <laughs> we're strangers. We're sojourners. We're strangers in a strange land. We're the opposite. We're, we're, we don't run with them anymore. And we don't belong there anymore. I think that's why, I don't know, I'm looking forward to going to be with the Lord. Looking forward to that day, that day of Christ, the day of the Lord. Anyway, because of the suffering of these uh, believing Jews then and the effects of sin, they no longer want to pursue those past sins, right? They no longer want to pursue it, and we don't either. But we are strangers and sojourners, so it's hard for them to understand where we're coming from. Now, we can look at our past, and when we came to the Lord, things really did change in our life, some more than others. Some were, <laughs> some, some of you were pretty radical. You know, I wasn't so much, but, you know, I wasn't into some of the things a lot of you guys may have been into, things that were very outward, but inward, there was a lot of things going on in my life. And so... Uh, coming to the Lord and standing firm on what I, I then believed, my friends thought it, you know, kind of strange. What's going on with Mike, man? He's not hanging out with us anymore, not going out and doing this and that. And so, but they saw it and they knew where I stood, and they'll, they'll see and they'll see the light too. And as we read this tonight, we'll see that uh, Peter really had a, a real passion. Well, real. Um, compassion for these non-believers but the unsaved will be judged you know they may attack for our faith but what are we to do pray for them pray for them pray for those who attack us pray for those who revile us or come against our our beliefs you know, just pray for them love them you know peter didn't uh like you said peter didn't attack I mean, uh, Jesus didn't attack those who reviled him and put him on the cross. You know, but he submitted to his father. You know, he humbled himself. So we need to pray for those unbelievers. Be a witness to them. But I don't think Peter was really condemning here in this verse. And for we know the Bible says, <laughs> you know, they condemn themselves. You know, those who don't believe are, you know, the unbelief, they, they condemn themselves, the Bible says. But he was compassionate. You know, the unsaved are blind to spiritual truth, right? Second Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. And they are dead in their trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1. The unsaved are dead in their own trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were made alive by Jesus Christ, by his spirit. And also, the unsaved need us. They really need us here. You know, it's, it's kind of tough sometimes living in California, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's beautiful weather. I love California. I grew up here. Haven't spent all my time here, but moved many other places, but um, things can get tough. But the unsaved here need us. They need to see the light. They need for us to be a witness to them. They need to us, they need to see the glory of God in us and ask, what is it that's in you that I want? I want some of that. That's what people need to see. To be salt, light, and be examples like Daniel was. Right? Like Joseph was. 
to be those examples of them around them because they, they suffered. <laughs> Verse 6. But for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. That's a great verse, verse 6. So fifthly, suffering puts us in good company with those who were martyred, those who went before us. I can't help think of uh, Stephen that was martyred for you know, standing up for the Lord, for preaching the gospel, for uh, just loving the Lord, for just being a, a light to those around him. Martyred, you know. I think of him. And when I'm going through something, I can think of men like that. You know, if Stephen went through that, I can surely go through this little time I'm going through right now or being hung on the cross upside down. You know, I, I, can, I can deal with those things today. You know, so we look in the past, we see that Peter, what Peter is really saying here, he's talking about those who suffered and died for righteousness, but now they're living in heaven. That's what he's saying here. Okay? They're living in heaven. They were judged by men. They were persecuted. They were put down by others. But now they're with the Lord. That's what we have to think of. You know, they were condemned. You know, prophets were condemned. They were beaten. You know, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. They were mocked by men. But now they're in paradise. <laughs> That's where we're going to be someday. Jesus said, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Isn't that great? <laughs> Blessed are you, you know, each one of you guys, when they accuse you falsely. Right? Oh, man. That was Matthew 5, 11, and 12. But he says here, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Oh, wow. It's almost like these prophets and those before us kind of, you know, they paved the way, you know, and they died for it. But I, I really believe that, uh, you know, they armed themselves too with right thinking, looking forward. Sixthly, suffering helps us to long for eternity. Verse 7. <laughs> it's to help us long for eternity. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. <laughs> so he's saying here, hey, the end of all things is at hand. Hey, the world is coming to an end. <laughs> things are coming to a close. So suffering does help us long for eternity. Hey, the longer I live, the more I long for eternity. <laughs> you know, my daughter is, well, she's approaching, well, she is 40 now. And she told me, you know, Dad, I really long for eternity. You know, when I was 40, I'm not sure if I could have said that. But she, and that really blessed my heart because, you know, she, she can see really what's going on and where she wants to be. And that really touched me because I, I, you know, I just need to keep my eyes on eternity. Eyes on eternity. You know, our aches and pains right now, our financial setbacks and, and the things that we go through right now, uh, and just seeing the events around us make us even more so long for his return, even right today, right? You know, the end of all things is at, at hand. You know, Peter said this a long time ago. And how many years have passed? And we're here right now. We're still here. But we're almost a couple thousand years closer. Peter was, at that time, it was, it was pretty radical at that time for the believers. But, hey, we're, we're some time later. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Verse 8. 
at hand. The time is at hand. The Greek word for that is approaching, coming near. <laughs> it's approaching, guys. It's coming near. And you could think of Noah during his time warning those around him, hey, the time is coming near. You know, it's going to rain. Things are going to flood. He announced that and because he, he knew it was coming. But you know when things are good and when they're running smooth for us, we kind of lose that, that, you know, looking out to that eternity a little bit, don't we? It's easy to. We can be drawn in by the things of the world and, and when things are smooth and we, we're doing this and that, we're busy in our time and doing things, maybe some trivial things, and we kind of lose that sight. And then suffering comes, some trials come, things come, and then we're praying, we're looking at Lord, this is not where I want to be. These trivial things I've been doing, maybe I can set those aside. And also, number seven, suffering brings on ministry. Wow, it brings on ministry. Let's look at uh, verse eight through 11. These are great verses here too, because they really are directly affect the body of Christ. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. The Lord knows that we do grumble. Hey, I grumble at times, but the Lord knows I'm that way. But Peter says here, hey, be hospitable, okay? You guys are going through this time. He's speaking to the Jews here in that time, in that area of Turkey. He's saying, hey, you know, be hospitable to one another. As each one received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, the many ways of God, the, the many aspects, uh, grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, the things of God. If anyone ministers, let him minister, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So let's look at Peter's list here, his commands. I have a simple list. As I think as we go along further in this chapter, we're going to see it being kind of like a Ten Commandment thing from, from Peter a little bit. First of all, he says, be serious and watchful in our prayers. The Revised Standard Version says, keep sane and sober for your prayers. And that sober means actually being steady, being clear in our prayers. Didn't Peter write this? Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's uh, chapter 1, verse 13. You know, gird up the loins of your mind. Be ready. Secondly, fervently love one another. Fervently, that word fervently means with intent. With intent, without ceasing. Oh, wow. I don't always do that. Fervently love one another. You know, we can get a little grumpy at times. And, you know, we serve together. We love one another. We may serve each other. Uh, you guys may work together. I don't know. The guys you may serve with at work in some way we get kind of grumpy, kind of at each other a little bit. You know, and that's okay. You know, the, you know, the Lord will forgive us. <laughs> and we can look forward and, and uh, continue and be fervent in it. Show fervent love for one another. And be hospitable. Number three, don't grumble. Open up your home. Open up our houses. And he was encouraging them to do the same thing. Because as they were going through the suffering, they could ask someone over for a bite to eat. <laughs> you know, come over and have hot dogs. You know, have a barbecue. You know, share things with them. You know, lift them up. And we're to do that same thing as we're, we go through suffering also. And then fourthly, minister 
your spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, Romans 12, 4 through 8, Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. Many of the gifts are listed there. Those gifts that God gives, not our own abilities, but the gifts that he bestows on us. Gifts of teaching, giving, exhortation, mercy, faith, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, all these gifts were to be used of. And for them, they needed to use them to minister to one another. Because what's the purpose of the gifts? To glorify God, to encourage one another, to exhort one another. We are to use these for the church body that what? God may be glorified. You know, when you look back on Gideon that we talked about before, the Lord wanted Gideon to shrink his army down to 300 because he didn't want Israel to take the glory against God. And so Peter writes here, as God supplies, do it with the ability, in verse 11, which God supplies, that in all these things he may be glorified through Christ Jesus. The Bible says, but, no one, but one in the same spirit works all these things, dis distributing to each one as he wills. You know, the Lord is going to use each one of you in these gifts as he wills, as the spirit wills. We, we can't bring them on ourselves. We can, ask, we can ask the Lord for them. Lord, use me of this gift. I've done that. And he didn't use me of that gift. <laughs> he used me of something else. When we least expect it sometimes, too. And then we go, oh, Lord, you're so good. You know, glorify your name, not me. So let us, through, let us through suffering commit to prayer, service, with a good conscience and all the glory going to God. You know, we can end this message tonight with, with actually verse 7. You can look at that and you go, but the end of all things is at hand. You know, I think you can read all these verses, but then you come back to that one, and you go, oh, but the end of all things is at hand. Do I really seriously believe that? Do we really seriously believe that? I think if we really did, we would look at all these things that Peter writes to them and to us and take it more seriously and have, a, have the mind of Christ. It kind of ties into the end of 2 Peter a little bit, doesn't it? Peter writes, Therefore, since all these things are dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's uh, 2 Peter 3.11. So knowing all these things are going to end, what manner of persons ought we to be? Amen? In holy conduct and godliness. So guys, as you spend the week, this week, the rest of this week, think on these things. Think, think of the things that Peter has write, written to us to take and to use and to apply to our lives. And knowing that things are at hand, the end of all things is at hand. Glorify God, give him the glory. And when you're suffering, give glory to the Lord and, and know that the suffering is going to bring about you know, joy and maturity in your life. So guys, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right, guys, let's pray.